nothing causes more mass hysteria, it seems like, than a presidential election. Okay, that was a bit of hyperbole, but yeah, people get all up in arms about <coughs> presidential elections and uh, the elections surrounding uh, those elections as well, and it, it just becomes a big to-do, and uh, the news covers it on a 24-hour cycle, and we know who, who did this and who won uh, this caucus over in this state and all this, and it just becomes rather wearisome pretty quickly, at least to me, but some people do find it interesting and more power to them. But what I find is that when an election year comes around, sometimes Christians forget to be Christians. And so th this sermon uh, is to kind of deal with that, not saying that I've seen these kinds of attitudes or behaviors here necessarily, but it, these are reminders that I think are, are good to pass around in, in uh, just about every four years. And I, I hope that this is helpful. My, my goal for this sermon is not to be offensive, but in a lot of cases when you start talking politics, people do get offended. Um, that's not my goal, but I recognize it can uh, go that way. And uh, if you are offended at anything that I say, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um, I, I believe that what I'll be pr presenting here is not Micah's opinion. It's not my uh, say-so, but rather based on scriptures and, and based on uh, things that are evidently true. And so I, I hope that this is helpful to you rather than hurtful. So what should we keep in mind in an election year? Number one, this election is not as important as you might think. And I realize that I'm kind of making a general statement there. That, that goes into what you think about this election. Do you think it's important? I don't know what you think about it. I really don't talk about politics all that much. Um, it's not th something I weave into my everyday conversation. But every once in a while, you'll hear even Christians say something to the effect of, man, this election is the most important election that we've ever had. Probably not. Usually what, what that is said every single election. Last election cycle, 2020 cycle, some people said, this is the most important election that we've ever had as a country. And now it's this one. And then four years from now, it'll be the next one. Well, let me just pump the brakes on that kind of thinking and turn over to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 8. Solomon says, All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear feel, filled with hearing. That which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see, see this, it is new? Already it has existed for ages which were before us. There is no remembrance of earlier things and also of the later things which will occur. There will be for them no remembrance among those who will come later still. Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. The things that are happening now have already happened in, in some way, shape, form. And they will continue to happen. Leaders rise into power. Leaders fall out of power. It happens every day, pretty much, in this world. And it has happened since the beginning of civil, civilization. And so when we come to this election, realize that there were other important elections before. There will be others after. But really, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that it's not all that important no matter what. Even if it is a, a relatively important election, things continue on. Things will continue on and, and go the, the way of time. And they will continue that way until Jesus comes back. And might I say that the panic that usually comes from post-election results usually is not justified. 
I remember back in, I'm showing my uh, lack of age here. I remember, I think, back in 2012, I think it's the second term that Obama was elected. Obama's second term when he, he won over Mitt Romney. And I remember we, we had a Bible study that night, and we were sitting and watching the election results afterward. And there were some conservative Christians when they saw that Obama was clearly going to be the, the winner, was pr pretty much named the winner at that point. And they just said, I can't believe where this country is going. Uh, and, and, you know, we already had one, one term of them, and they're giving him more, and it, it's just going to get worse. And there was a lot of fear, anxiety, panic in the room. That's how I would, I would say it. Well, his second term came and went, and yes, he did some things that I don't agree with. He did some things that were immoral. But here we are. We're almost 12, 12 years removed from all of that. But I also remember 2016 when Donald Trump was elected. And you remember that there was such panic that colleges were canceling classes and giving students just a day to basically cry it out. Because they were so freaked out that Donald Trump did. And his turn came and went. And here we still are. And yes, Donald Trump did some things that I, I don't agree with. He did some good things, just like I believe Obama he did some good things as well. But you see, after every election, after when the... the Smoke clears and the results are posted. People lose their minds. I can't believe this candidate won. And the country is going to go downhill so fast now. And it usually doesn't. Now, I recognize that one day, during somebody's tenure as president, it's possible that America could cease to be, that we could lose some kind of war, that uh, you know, things could get really bad here. I recognize that. And we could have an argument over whether the president sitting at the time was responsible for that or whether it was the guy before him and all sorts of political debates. But let's just remember that things like this happen. Leaders come into power, leaders fall out of power, and the world keeps going. Second thing I want to remind you of is that politicians are not Jesus. And it feels kind of silly saying that, right? It feels silly to have to say that in some, in some regards. I think we all recognize that no person can attain to the perfection that is Jesus Christ. And yet, I find that sometimes even Christians can make a political figure into an idol. They can put their trust in them and, and a political figure can do no wrong, even to a Christian. And we can't fall victim to that kind of thinking. Over in Psalm 118, if you'll turn over there, Psalm 118. In verse 8, it says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Sometimes we can fall victim to putting our trust in man, to putting our trust in princes. We think to ourselves, you know, if just this candidate will get elected, then this country is going to be better and they're going to be more God-fearing. And let me tell you, that's never going to happen. Because unless we're following Jesus, this country is never going to get better. This country is never going to be more righteous. Now, hopefully, our president is a God-fearing man who fears God and, and keeps his commandments. But that is usually not the case. Let me give you some examples. Donald Trump, 
to a lot of Christians, Donald Trump can do no wrong. A few months ago, Donald Trump shared a video that somebody else made, and I recognize somebody else made it, but he shared it, he endorsed it. In this video, the, the video is called God Made Trump. I want you to listen to, to some of the words that were said in this video. God said, I need somebody who will be strong and courageous, who will not be afraid or terrified of the wolves when they attack a man who cares for the flock, a shepherd to mankind who will never leave nor forsake them. So God made Trump. Do you see what has just been what, what just happened there? Who in the Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? Who in the Bible says, I am the good shepherd? Is, is the Bible talking about Donald Trump there? No, it's talking about God. It's talking about Jesus. Again, Donald Trump didn't make this video. Somebody else made it, but he shared it. He endorsed it. He agrees with what it says. He's co-opted biblical language about God and made it be about himself. He's turned himself into an idol. And I can tell you that Christians do often talk about Donald Trump in almost idol idolatrous terms. And this is not the first time that, that Trump has done something like that. I, I remember back in the election cycle coming up before uh, Trump went against Biden, at the Republican convention, uh, Mike Pence made a speech that said that we, we fix our eyes on old glory and, and look to it. And, and he was talking about the American flag and, and talking about, you know, its representation of America. But he used language from Hebrews chapter 12 where we fix our eyes on Jesus and he go up to that and be talking about America. They've turned themselves into idols. Donald Trump makes himself out to be a, a champion of, of Christian ideals and, and basically, basically to be God's chosen person to lead this nation. And I understand that God chooses leaders and, and puts them in where he, he sees fit. But this language, it's idolatrous. And it's evil and it's wicked. And we should call it out for what it is. And if that's not satisfying to you, I'm, I'm not going to mention what he said. But, you know, Donald Trump has had, a, a, had a affairs cheated on his wife. He said vile, horrible things about women and how to, how to treat them. He's not Jesus. He's not morally a good person. Let me come to the other side of the fence now. This year, Joe Biden proclaimed March 31st, Easter Sunday, the annual Transgender Day of Visibility. And yes, March 31st is always the day that they proclaim as the Transgender Day of Visibility. And it happened that Easter fell on March 31st this year. I get that. But first of all, let's just recognize that proclaiming any day as a day to celebrate transgenders, that is breaking the gender roles that God has given to us, breaking the, the very nature that God has assigned to us, that's wrong. But then to go and take the day that Jesus was raised from the dead and put it side by side with this transgender day of visibility, that's wicked. That's wrong. It's sickening. <coughs> Joe Biden has signed things into law that <clears throat> very much support the, the LGBTQ agenda and, and transgenderism and... Uh, Abortion as well. He, he's a very strong supporter of, of abortion. These things are not right. <coughs> but even in the candidates we have now, you think, okay, that's candidates we have now. Some people like to look back and, and, and say, oh, if we only had this guy running again. For example, for Republicans, they love Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the, the pinnacle of, of what a Republican should be in the eyes of the Republican. 
And I'll admit he did some good things. But you know one thing that he did that has caused perhaps more damage than anything that Joe Biden has done, arguably? Ronald Reagan signed into law no cause divorce. That you can fracture your family for seemingly no reason at all. And if you want to look at the, the state of degradation of this country, you have to look at the state of the family. Well, Ronald Reagan made that possible. He signed into law no cause divorce. Over on the other side, Democrats love JFK. Well, JFK allegedly had multiple affairs while he was even while he was in office. My point is not to, to throw mud and, and be offensive, but just to point out people of the world, politicians especially, who a lot of them make a living off of lying and telling people what they want to hear, are not your moral superheroes. They're not the champions of, of Christ. They're not the champions of, of righteousness. And it goes on and on. Every single politician, you can find, find things like this that they've done. At least the, the, the big ones. <laughs> My point is, sometimes when we're dealing with elections, we can take the moral high ground against the other side. Back in the, the Trump-Biden election, people said, if you vote for, for Biden, you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. And people would go and turn and say the same, well, if you vote for Trump, you're not a Christian. <clears throat> I'm not saying either of those are right or wrong. And that's maybe a discussion for another day. But let's just realize that both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, they're not righteous. They don't measure up to Jesus' righteousness. They don't measure up to that biblical standard of righteousness. They, they don't even measure up to, to what Christians are called to be in the New Testament. And so let's not think that they do. And let's not take moral high ground against our brethren and say, if you vote this way, you're not a, a Christian None of the candidates are desirable when we're, we're holding up them up to the standard of Jesus. And that's why this next, this next point is the most important. We need to remember that God rules in the kingdoms of men. He's in control. I had Matthew read Daniel chapter 4. And for time's sake, we won't read that again. But even Nebuchadnezzar, who had lifted himself up in pride and, and said that he had done all these great things and that Babylon was his glory and his splendor, he was put in check real quick and reminded that, no, it's God who's in control. The Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. And he does whatever he wishes. He puts people in power. He takes people out of power. It's based on His will. It's based on His initiative. In that passage that Matthew read at the end, it says, And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, say to him What have you done? In the book of Job, God essentially asked Job, Are, are you my counselor? Are you the one who's keeping me in check? And of course the answer was no. Who, who keeps God in check? Who, who is the one who's giving him counsel and, and making sure that he walks the straight and narrow? Nobody. God doesn't need anybody to be his counselor. He is the creator of the whole world. He alone is wise. He alone is righteous. And he's the one who rules. He is our king. We answer to him first and foremost. In Isaiah chapter 52. In 
Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7. It says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Your God reigns. Christ is King. Jesus reigns. And our answering is to Him first and foremost. Now I recognize that Romans chapter 13 talks about how we ought to be obedient to the government, and certainly we should, because God is the one who gives them authority. And that's a great reminder to us that whoever is elected, that we're under their authority, that they've been put there by God, good decisions, bad decisions, we listen to them so long as we do not transgress the commands of God. We ought to obey God rather than men. But sometimes we forget that it's God who's on His throne, especially at this time in election cycles. We tend to forget that it's God who's on His throne. And we fixate on whoever is President of the United States or whoever has control of the Senate or whoever has control of the House. God has control of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches and everything higher than that. He's the one who rules and who's in control. And even if America were to, to stop existing tomorrow, God would still be in control. And our allegiance would still be to Him. And that's another part of this reminder is that we're citizens of heaven first, not Americans. Over in Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, in verse 20 it says, For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body out of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. Jesus has the power to subject all things to Himself, and He is, and He has, and He will continue. He will subject even death to Himself. He will conquer death. In that last day when he comes back in judgment and we are raised from the dead. But our citizenship is in heaven. Christ is our king. And yes, I'm not saying that we aren't Americans, but we aren't Americans first. We are citizens of heaven first. And that is our ultimate allegiance. Most of the time, being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven and being an American, they don't run counter to each other. We can be both. But there are times where, where, where we will have to choose. Where we will have to choose, do I believe what the Bible says or do I believe the Bill of Rights? Do I believe the Founding Fathers or do I believe God? We have to keep in mind our allegiance. We have to be careful of reading the Bible through an American lens and justifying things that we, we believe to be American and our inherent rights when the Bible runs contrary to them. We have to be careful of that. God rules in the kingdoms of men. He's in control. Whoever wins this election, whoever comes into power, God put him there. And yes, it could be to, to take him out of power very swiftly. It could be to overthrow America. We, we don't know what God is going to do. We sing a song 
The kingdoms of earth pass away one by one, but the kingdom of heaven remains. We look at history, the greatest world powers, they all fell away eventually. We don't know when America will. But as a Christian, it really shouldn't be much of an issue. Because our allegiance is still to God. We're reminded that God is in control. And that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. That all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. If we keep those things in mind, ultimately an election year becomes just another cycle. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. I'm not saying you should can't be involved in, in politics and find it interesting and be uh, involved in, in some way in, in political functions. But what I am saying is, ultimately, you have to know where your allegiance lies. It's not to the Republican Party. It's not to the Democratic Party. It's not even to the United States of America, not to the president. Ultimately, it's to God. If you don't get that right, if you don't get your priorities right, then what happens is, as these election years go around, these election cycles come, and you will find yourself in a state of panic. You will find yourself red in the face, mad at somebody because they support the other candidate. Ultimately, what election years can do is they can stir up strife within the church. And they often do. But if we keep these things in mind, then we're going to be grounded. And we're not going to be biting each other's heads off and, and backbiting and devouring one another. But we're going to be at peace and we're going to be on the winning side. That is God's side. I hope that these things have been helpful to you. Again, the purpose is not to shock you or be offensive, but rather just take some biblical principles and apply them to where I think they fit. Understanding that God rules in the kingdoms of men, that He reigns. Isaiah 52 calls that the good news, which... When we trans translate that over to the New Testament, it's called the Gospel. The Gospel is that God reigns. That He's in control. And the reason that that's good news is because He's able to take care of you. He's able to, to meet every single one of your needs. The chiefest, the greatest of needs is the need to be cleansed from your sin. To be free from sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, as we talked about this morning. It is through Him alone that you can conquer and overcome. If your allegiance is not to Jesus, why not? Every other person, every other ruler, every other principality, they'll let you down. They don't take care of you the way that Jesus can. And we must not forget that. Are you willing to put your faith and trust in Jesus? Will you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess Jesus before men and be baptized into Him for the remission of sins? You can do that tonight if you need to. If you are a Christian, but perhaps your allegiance is sway, perhaps you've taken your eye off of the prize, off of the reward, off of heaven, and thought, and given in to, to earthly thoughts and worries and, and sin and passion, well, tonight you can change your way of thinking. You can repent of the things that you've done wrong. You can ask for the prayers of the saints. You can ask for encouragement, whatever you might need. If you have any need this evening, won't you come while we stand and sing?